Shown here is the concept of serial endosymbiosis. We start with the cell that in fact is lacking in an endosymbiont, so minus this A individual here. Uh, then we have acquisition of a cell within the original cell, and that is our initial endosymbiont. This, for example, could be a mitochondrion. This could be the larger cell, uh, a eukaryote, now a mitochondrial eukaryote. The acquisition of a second endosymbiont uh, then can occur, and uh, this second endosymbiont could, for example, be a uh, plastid, uh, for example, a cyanobacterium giving rise to a eukaryotic algae cell. Uh, conceivably, there can be additional endosymbionts that can be acquired, and this is being shown uh, with individual uh, C, another cell uh, that is being acquired by the original cell, and thus this original cell now contains three endosymbionts, A, B, and C. The cells that find their way into uh, a host cell in this manner, the endosymbionts, uh, have a potential to uh, degrade over time in terms of their genetic repertoire, and in fact they can degrade to the point where they don't carry DNA at all, although that, that actually seems to be a relatively unusual situation. Uh, instead, what we typically see is uh, in mitochondria and plastids is the retention of uh, tens or even a uh, hundred or more genes uh, in association with these organelles. Uh, and thus they remain as essentially bacterial cells that are living inside of eukaryotic cells, but they're much reduced in uh, their uh, genetic potential uh, in comparison to um, the uh, cells that they were when they were first acquired as endosymbionts. Their genes, though, haven't necessarily completely gone away, but instead tend to migrate into the nuclear genome, uh, where then they are expressed, and those uh, expressed genes, the resulting proteins, then migrate back to the endosymbiont.